When students walk into my class, they're taking History 102, modern world. What they're used to is high school. What they're used to is the dates, the famous events, the wars, the politics. Uh, some of my better students have been exposed to teachers who give them a feel for uh, what these things have as an effect on various demographic groups, the effects of slavery on African Americans and people in that the African diaspora. That's just one example. What I try to do when I teach my classes is to enrich my classes, to show that you can see history in many different ways. You can see history by the person who is sitting next to you in class. How did they get there? What is the immigration pattern? Why, why did their ancestors migrate? Uh, you can also see history in the language we use, how did certain words make them their way into our culture? But you can also see it in very, very tiny things. Sometimes things that are hanging out in sport or leisure or entertainment that we really don't think about or spend time with. Today I'm covering the Alexandra fly, something that fly fishermen, people out catching trout, bass, or panfish at the local pond, be very familiar with. As a fisherman, I know that if I walk up and say, here, try this fly, I'm going to have someone who's happy, who's caught a fish, and had, walks on with their day a little brighter. But what they don't realize is that the fly that I handed them is emblematic of a whole bunch of things that happened in the world. That in that one tiny article, you can see so many facets of the world of the 1800s. You're thinking, I caught a fish. I'm thinking, what a cool piece of history. And it's still in our lives. And that's the purpose of doing this kind of presentation. History is alive. It is in the things around us. It is in the tiny things around us. You don't have to always worry about memorizing a date. You don't always have to worry about what was the political implication. You can sometimes think, fishing fly. That is so cool. When you teach world history, uh, you need to cover the 1800s. 1800s, when covered by most college history professors, is going to cover the Industrial Revolution around the world. It's going to cover colonialism, the colonization of not only Africa but Southeast Asia. It's going to, a good history teacher is going to cover the rise of the middle class in Europe. Right? Uh, you will cover war, and you will look at history from many, many different angles. But what we tend to forget about with history is we forget about the fact that you can see history in a very tiny, tiny things. Right? Um, you don't always have to look at the impacts of history one at a time. Sometimes you can combine them together to one article or, or one event or one painting. Uh, the one that I want to look at today is a single fishing fly. Um, fly fishing has been very, very popular for hundreds of years. I'm a fly fisherman myself. Uh, people at the, around this college be very familiar with Awatka Creek, uh, Caledonia, and the first uh, trout fishing hatchery in North America. Right? Uh, but the fishing fly that I want to deal with is one that is made in England in the 1850s. And I want to show you how it is emblematic of a lot of things going on in the world. First of all, we're talking about England, so we should talk about England in the 1850s to 1900s. So we're talking about English Empire, or as we say, this empire where the sun never sets. You have British colonies in the Pacific, you have British colonies in Australia, Africa, South America, Canada, or around the world, British Empire is huge. Inside of England, we need to talk about things like the Industrial Revolution that's changing the face of society, growing huge cities, giving us pollution in the form of coal, and the coal soot that's falling in the air. But England is more than that. England is also the place during the Industrial Revolution where you're growing a society and you're growing a middle class. And middle class men like to enjoy themselves like anyone else. They want to go on vacation. They want to get out into the country. They want to be the gentleman. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to go fishing. 
Here is a picture from uh, the 1800s of a gentleman out fishing. Right? Uh, you'll notice the fishing pole doesn't look quite like what we have now. He's not wearing the fancy waders that he bought online at Amazon. All right? um, but he is enjoying himself out for a day of fishing. Notice he's wearing a tie and a suit jacket, something that you won't find on most streams nowadays, because this is a gentleman's sport. He is not fishing for meat on the table. Right? He is not fishing because he has to. He's fishing because he wants to, because he wants to enjoy himself. He is a, probably an upper middle class man right, with leisure time. This is something new in the 1800s, a middle class with leisure time. Your second picture. It's another picture of a group of men out fishing. Right. These from a boat. Also notice, it's the same type of deal. These men are not dressed in a lower middle class status. They're dressed for an upper middle class status. And again, the fish that they're catching is a trout. Uh, they're out fishing for sport, not for consumption. This was highly popular, not only in England, but also in North America. And here's a specific fly I'd like to talk about. This is the Alexandria fly. The Alexandra dates all the way back to the 1850s. Its original name was the Lady of the Lake. That was the original name of the fly. And I'll also explain why we changed the name. But what I'd like to do is argue that a fly made in 1850, 1860, is emblematic of its time period. And you look at that and you go, emblematic of its time period? Well, let's look at all the different parts to that fly. Let's start with the hook. The hook itself is a product of mass production. It's a product of the Industrial Revolution. The mass production of fishing hooks makes leisure sport fishing possible. It produces them cheaply. It allows for the construction of new fishing rods, of new forms of line, of new ways of presenting a lure to the fish. Okay. Um, the barbed snell hook is also part of an industrial revolution. You can go online and you can see in articles on JSTOR about the importance of other products that look very similar, including numerous articles written on the production of needles in the, in the industrial revolution. Uh, let's look at the feathers that are being used, the tinsel, and the thread. Again, thread is part of the Industrial Revolution, the mass production of cloth and cloth products, the expansion, especially in England. The tinsel is part of the Industrial Revolution because it's being used in, in things like women's hats, which I'll talk about later. The other pieces of this also about from women's hats are the use of the various feathers. You have the use of chicken. There aren't many purple chickens in the world. Uh, this is a dyed feather right, uh, for use in the hatware. Also, this bright red piece is from duck wing. Again, dyed, dyed bright red. Uh, this was originally for the women's hat industry. The final piece is the, the bright uh, green, blue, uh, shimmery material you see is actually from a peacock, and we'll talk about the peacock next. The peacock is not something that is running around wild in England. The peacock is actually from Southeast Asia, specifically around India. Right. If you think 1800s India, who has access to peacock feathers on a regular basis? This would be the British in a number of ways. One is peacock feathers coming back because they have soldiers stationed over there. We want to bring something back for mom. You want to add something to your, your, your souvenirs from India, you can bring back a peacock feather. You could also bring back peacock feathers for that trade, for the women's hat trade. Right? Uh, you can bring up peacock feathers as a commodity. Uh, this is specifically a British thing. You do not find this fly in North America until after the 1900s. You do not find this fly in Ireland, where they don't have easy access to peacock feathers, uh, you find it specifically where the trade is important um, and ongoing, and that is in southern England. England just colonize, is colonizing India at this period of time, so the peacock makes it into uh, their 
fly fishing catalog. Uh, if England was not colonizing India at this period of time, say it was colonizing uh, New Guinea, then we'd be talking about using things like the birds of paradise. If they were colonizing uh, Florida, you'd be talking about using like the American egret and, fe and fishing flies. Uh, because of the colonization in India, you're talking about the use of a peacock feather. An interesting piece of trivia when it comes to this fly is that this fly is considered so good when it is made, it catches so many fish that it is banned on streams inside of England. Right? It's actually against the rules to use this fly because the fish can't resist it. The picture I have right now, uh, the young lady on the screen, is actually from 1863. This is a portrait of the Princess Alexandra of Denmark. You say, wait a minute, Alexandra, Denmark, how does this tie in with a fishing fly from England? Again, think of politics and think of what's going on inside of Europe at this time. Queen Victoria and her royal family, Queen Victoria is notorious for marrying her family off into all the other noble families of Europe. By the time you get to World War I, the Kaiser in Germany is a direct cousin with the King of England. The Tsar of Russia is a cousin of the English royal family. Right? When Alexandra marries into the British royal family, it is cause of celebration in the nation. Right? As part of the celebration, they, uh, the fishermen renamed the beautiful Alexandra fly after the beautiful Princess Alexandra. So inside the fly, you can also see a little bit, uh, in one way, a history of politics in Europe in the 1800s. I wanted to add this piece because this is a picture of a woman wearing a hat from the 1800s. Uh, the women wearing hats uh, were very much in tune with a statement of not only fashion but of status. So it was higher status to have a hat that was not only flamboyant but had items on it that came from around the world. Historians have worked with this a bit. There have been documentaries and shows and articles written about uh, the destruction of birds and habitats around the world as people went out to look for the rare exotic feathers. Right? Specifically in the United States and Florida, much of Florida was hunted out for its exotic birds, especially things like egrets, for the hat trade. Um, the use of ostrich feathers, the use of birds of paradise, uh, these things made a statement about the status of the woman uh, that she flaunted on her hat. Uh, the women's hat trade cannot be underestimated, in my opinion, in its impact on the fishing uh, uh, in the same period of time, because these men who are looking to create, and it is a bit of art, it is a bit of historical art, art history if you would, to show that the uh, materials that were being used were those available to the men. Mom's getting rid of the feathers. She's getting rid of her old hat. What can I do with them? How can I repurpose them? They're bright. They're colorful. I can use them when I tie my lures to see if it attracts the fish. Uh, which ties in women. It ties in the status of women, how women are so showing their social status. And it is also showing that women, too, are being impacted by the Industrial Revolution and the rise of middle class uh, in their time period. Uh, gender historians, where people looking at women at this time, talk about the cult of domesticity, the cult of what it is to be a stay-at-home woman. Right? Uh, this is part of that. This is part of showing the status and role of elite, of elite women. I'm done. <laughs>